On this week's Nesson Patriots podcast, we will discuss the Patriots' inactivity at the trade deadline. We will recap their win over the Cleveland Browns, and we will preview their toughest matchup of the season, upcoming against the Baltimore Ravens. and Patriots podcast. I am Doug Kide. Joined as always by Zach Cox. Zach, how are you doing? Doing well, Doug. Getting that little first kind of inkling of, of a, a little cold or a little mm. sickness here with the, the weather changing up here in New England, but glad to be trapped I'm in power- the room with you then. Yes, sir. I'm powering through it, though. Hopefully <laughs> I'll, I'll stay far away. I'll stay on, on, on my side of the studio over here. Perfect, perfect. Uh, all right, so we've got a lot to discuss today. The Patriots beat the Cleveland Browns 27-13. to They've got as I mentioned earlier, their toughest match of the season coming up against the Baltimore Ravens. But they also have a rookie wide receiver, Nikhil Harry, their first round pick in 2019, potentially playing this week. So let's start off the conversation with that. Expectations for Nikhil Harry as he possibly gets ready for his, the first game of his NFL career. We really didn't see that much of him this summer. Um, he played in one preseason game, but he was banged up a lot of the time for the most part. So I don't know. It's almost tough to say what we should expect out of Harry when he does finally make his, his NFL debut, which we're assuming will come this week, even though he has not been activated to the 53-man roster yet. Yeah, the Patriots do have an open roster spot after cutting uh, Eric Tomlinson yesterday. So uh, assuming as long as they don't use that that spot on somebody else in the next couple days, it would make sense for Nikhil Harry to be the player who does take over that open roster spot. And for me, I'm not expecting a lot from him right away. Immediately in the kind of immediate future this week, I do not expect him to make a significant impact, even if he is active for this game, because you never really see that with any receiver who comes in to this Patriots offense. Even even veteran receivers, even even Mohamed Sanu, he played what was it, 24, 25 snaps in his first game. I think it was 36 snaps. 36 snaps, yeah. tar- but, but he had two catches, uh, right. was targeted five times. It was a, it, it was, the, the, the Patriots like to kind of ease these new receivers mm-hmm. into this offense, and new players, period, any kind of skill position players, they're usually sort of eased in and, and taken kind of a, a slow path with them. With Harry, I think, I mean, he's a first-round pick, so he, he enters with, with some pretty high expectations, but this is a guy who didn't practice for 10 full weeks at a time when practice reps are vitally important to right. your to your development, not even just with Tom Brady, just as an NFL player overall. So I do think it's going to be a little bit of a kind of adjustment uh, building up period as he, he gets back in there. He has been back on the practice field for two weeks, and from the, the reports that we've heard from coaches, he's, he's kind of impressing and working his way back uh, back into the mix doing a lot of scout team work but also getting a little bit of work with Tom Brady I don't know I could see him being a factor in the second half of the season but I think people who are expecting that to happen right now might be a little bit disappointed I don't know what's your read on this I think that the the comparison to Sanu or even Josh Gordon last season Antonio Brown this season isn't a perfect one but I do think that they are similar enough because so those guys had NFL experience obviously yeah. so they were coming in with that head up on on Nikhil Harry at the same time Nikhil Harry has actually been looking at this playbook true since April so he kind of has a leg up on them in that regard uh, which I mean it's not insignificant that he actually knows the playbook that he's been able to practice with the team now for a couple of weeks um, that even when he was injured, he was in meetings and doing all these other things. So, uh, as I said, I, I just I don't think that's insignificant. At the same time, since he doesn't have that NFL experience, since this is his NFL debut, um, Josh Gordon, I believe, played 20 snaps in his first game last year with the Patriots. Antonio Brown played 24 earlier this season with the Patriots. And uh, as I mentioned, Mohamed Sanu had 36 snaps or 37 snaps in his debut this week. So I might expect somewhere in that, you know, 
20 to 36 range. I know that's a fairly large range, maybe on the on the smaller scale there on, on 20 to 25 or something like that. But you do want you you want to see what you have in the guy. Obviously, he's got a lot of talent. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been a first round pick. So I'd say that, you know, that's probably what I would be looking at for him here in his NFL debut. And I think that eventually, I think we said it on last week's podcast, he could actually wind up being a starter on this offense because he really is the only player that the Patriots have at wide receiver who looks like a prototypical X receiver. He's six foot two, two hundred twenty-five pounds, somewhere around there, six three, six four, whatever he is. Um, and the Patriots don't have another. I guess Mohamed Sanu is a similar body type, but he's never been that receiver because he always was playing with the Julio Jones or AJ Green or these other prototypical X receivers. He played the majority of his snaps last week in the slot last week, so I expect that to continue moving forward. Him and Elvin to be sharing that slot slash Z receiver role. So if you say that Nikhil Harry is that X receiver, it's also the easiest role for him to actually come in and play because he doesn't he can't go in motion yeah. playing in the X receiver role. And Matt Chatham said it this week uh, on one of our Nesson broadcasts that, you know, that's he can do isolated route routes from the X receiver spot. He's kind of on his own island over there. He doesn't have to be worrying about working in tandem with Edelman or with Sanu or with Philip Dorsett. So I do expect him to be in that role uh, here with the Patriots and eventually maybe taking on a, a starting role. But until then, I would expect, you know, them to be mixing snaps and sharing snaps between him, Dorsett, Julian Edelman, Mohamed Sanu, and maybe even Jacoby Myers if he's also active. Yeah, it definitely simplifies things a lot when you're out on that that X receiver yeah. spot, um, more so than, than being in the slot or being at the Z. And that's a position that, that Nikhil Harry played throughout his college career very successfully and when you look at his his body type and his skill set he's definitely the most similar player that the Patriots have to Josh Gordon and it yep. really isn't particularly close because he's very similar to Josh Gordon in a lot of ways I wouldn't be surprised if they use him in sort of a specialized role I guess right. you could say this week where I, I think he's going to be a a very viable red zone threat for this team when, with his kind of contested catch ability mm-hmm. uh, and ability to make plays in traffic that a lot of these other receivers on this team don't really have, either because of their body type or just because of their skill set or, or what have you. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him kind of be used more in, in sort of, if, if they enter this game saying, okay, if we're in kind of X down in distance yep. at the, the 17 yard line, this is going to be a Nikhil play. Uh, and try to work him in a little bit that way. And then as you, as the weeks go forward, especially since they do have an, a bye week, so they have two more weeks to, right. to kind of build up his his uh, involvement and his, his kind of work in the offense, then I could think I could see it kind of continuing to blossom from there. Yeah, that's a really good point about the bye week. It, it might not really be until week 11 that we really see what the Patriots can do with Nikhil Harry because that does give them a lot of time to be to be working with them. Which, um, is, which is why that I thought, last or coming into this week now it seems like they are going to activate him this week but it wouldn't have been shocking to see them just keep him off the roster for an extra game because they don't need to activate him until next Tuesday they can they can keep him off the roster until then so if they wanted to give him another full two and a half weeks or whatever Mm -hmm. to get ready for his debut they could have done that but again it does seem like it's it's trending toward him being active uh, activated in time for this game yeah and I mean I suppose that even if he is activated perhaps he still would not be active or maybe he would still play a, a small role because Patriots I don't know I mean if they weren't going to use Eric Tomlinson anyway then he might as well cut him and then bring Harry aboard um, let's talk about the Patriots well the Patriots we can mention this very briefly the Patriots didn't technically do something at the trade deadline but they did acquire Mohamed Sanu last week we already talked about that I believe we did we did a lot of Sanu talk last week um so no need to get into that but I was not overly surprised why the Patriots didn't make another move at the trade deadline and Bill Belichick kind of mentioned why that was the case on his conference call yesterday and that's the Patriots really did not have enough cap space to do anything and they would have really had to plan ahead to fit another player on their roster because they probably would have had to free up cap space on, what was it, Monday in order for that to go through by the time that they acquired a player on Tuesday. There was no wiggle, there's no wiggle room when you're acquiring a player on the actual trade, trade deadline. You can't announce it the next day. It, it, there's a deadline in place. Th- that was a really good point that, that Belichick brought up, the one that I personally hadn't, hadn't even considered. I'd kind of forgotten the fact that because everybody always says like, oh, they'll they'll be able to acquire whoever. Like if if they bring them in, they can just kind of extend so and so's contract right. or, or do some finagling on uh, convince 
Tampa Bay to like <laughs> right. restructure his contract. You can't really do that on the day when there is kind of a hard and fast deadline there. So definitely limited their options. I, I would assume there was probably a pretty small pool of players that the Patriots were interested in or, yeah. or considering um, yesterday ahead of the trade deadline. And when none of those deals worked out, then Patriots just stood pat with, with what they did last week with the, uh, the Mohamed Sanu trade and the Michael Bennett trade. Yeah, so I mean the the areas where people expected them to make a move offensive line, they've got Isaiah Wynn coming back. He returned to practice today, so seems like he probably will be back on the field in week twelve against the Cowboys when he's eligible. So that will be a significant boost. Uh Patriots will be getting Shaq Mason back at some point back from that ankle injury. And then at tight end, the Patriots have Ben Watson in there. I would I, I did a, a projected depth chart, I guess I would say today. And I mean, I would have him as my starting tight end throughout the rest of the season Agreed. over guys like Matt Lacoste and Ryan Izzo. Uh, perhaps they, they slot Matt Lacoste back in there when he's healthy. He was back at practice today as well. But, I mean, the guy just hasn't been healthy. So, I don't know, even if you put him in your starting lineup, you plan all week for him to be your start, top tight end, and then he goes out there and gets hurt. And it's like, well, what are we doing here? Basically, to, to quote Bill Belichick, you know that Ben Watson's been um, a lot more reliable for you, and, and it seems like Tom Brady certainly trusts him. He's been doing well as a, as a run blocker. So I would probably just continue to roll with, with Watson as that number one tight end. And that in itself gave the Patriots a fairly large boost to that position. Yeah, I would be pretty surprised, honestly, if, if Ben Watson wasn't their starting tight end moving forward, even once Lacoste and Izzo get healthy just because, one, the reliability and, and kind of dependability factor, and two, it's clear that Tom Brady has so much more trust in Ben Watson yeah. than he does in either of the, those two other guys. Uh, it was interesting to see Ben Watson get a lot more fullback work in this yeah. last game. Uh, in the previous game, Watson did a little bit of that, but it was mostly Eric Tomlinson in that role. Uh, Watson really kind of expanded um, his, or they, the Patriots really expanded Watson's usage there, maybe under the assumption that they were going to, to cut Eric Tomlinson Obviously, and might not have since, him moving since forward. Tomlinson was already cut <laughs> yeah, so before was, they placed Josh Gordon on injury. It could have been a, like, let's make sure that, that Watson can actually do this while we're, while we're moving forward. Um, and obviously that's, he, he's not going to kind of replicate James Devlin type, uh, body moving in that right. role, but he is someone that they can stick in there and at least kind of mix mix things around with but yeah i i would be very surprised if it's not uh if he's not the main guy moving forward yeah and yeah i think he should be um let's talk about that browns game uh certainly was not perfect from an offensive standpoint i know that we've kind of been saying that all year but of the season i mean they won 27 13 um they had three consecutive turnovers on defense uh one of which was a touchdown but, I mean, when you consider the fact that Mike Nugent, who the Patriots cut this week, replaced with Nick Folk, when you consider that he missed two field goals, and they were both short field goals as well. Missed one and had one blocked. But yeah. it looked like the one was blocked was uh, a mistake on his part. It looked like he was a little slow to get to the ball. Yeah, I mean, and the, the one, one of the field goals they actually made was a, like a line drive, a low yeah. line drive on a short field goal, which, I mean, the, most kickers... Don't need to be hitting line drives on short field goals yeah, as it pretty is. Pretty clear he was not. Uh, he was not long for this team. But if the Patriots had won, you know, thirty three thirteen as they probably should have, then that score looks significantly different, um, and it looks significantly better as well. Um, but no, I mean, I thought that the Patriots' offense was fine, and obviously their defense had another strong performance with those three consecutive turnovers. They did struggle a bit against the run. Nick Chubb ran for, I believe it was 131 yards. He did have the two fumbles. However, Patriots got out to a big lead, which, you know, once you're out to a big lead, you basically have to worry less about defending the run. You, you almost want to tell the opposing team, all right, knock yourself out running the ball. We, we don't really care if, if you continue to rack up yards because we're probably going to win as you wind down the clock. I, I do view it a little differently, though, because Nick Chubb was very productive running the ball basically from the start of the game, yep. except for the fact that he did fumble on his first two carries. But right. his second carry, he gained about 50 yards True. before he did so. Yeah. I think at the end of the third quarter, he had already racked up like 125 rushing yards or, or something yeah. to that effect. So, yeah, rush, uh, run defense has been a bit of an issue for the Patriots in the last couple weeks. Uh, overall, this was a little bit of a different defensive por- performance than we've seen yeah. of late. This wasn't like the game that they had against the Jets or, or even the game they had against the Giants where they just clearly dominated the other offense so thoroughly throughout mm-hmm. the entire game. They had those three turnovers right at the beginning, and overall they did play well because they only allowed 13 points. But 
Browns were able to move the ball pretty consistently, both on the ground and through the air for for a lot of the game. I think yeah. uh, Baker Mayfield looked. I I almost think this was a step forward for Baker Mayfield, which it was, was strange, yeah. because he didn't look. They weren't able to kind of make him see ghosts, quote unquote, or, right. or do anything like that. Um, but I think this was also a good thing for the Patriots, playing a semi-capable offense and still ending up ending up kind of holding him to to thirteen points and being it, it we never reached a point where it felt like that game was kind of seriously in doubt for the Patriots even no. though the the Browns were only down I think only down a touchdown early in the second half or down 10 points but yeah overall it was it's it's just kind of continuing the the trend of the Patriots defense doing what it has to do with turnovers and with sacks because what do they have five sacks in this game yeah Three I mean turnovers it, it's it also says a lot about the Patriots punt. defense yeah. when they Baker Mayfield went 20 of 31 for 194 yards with a touchdown interception. And that was a good performance. And that was a, a decent, and th- this is what we're talking about with the Patriots not looking quite as good. I mean, they still had five sacks. Uh, the Browns only had 151 net passing yards, um, and they did pick off Mayfield. It was on a kind of a weird play. Shovel pass. Yeah. Shovel pass that went straight into Lawrence Guy's arms. Yeah. I didn't mean this as a Patriots were played did not play as well in this game. I guess right. it was just that the offense was a little more. It wasn't. It was the Jets game. It wasn't like basically, a the beating. Jets didn't even have an offense essentially in that game. Right. The Browns at least were putting up some sort of resistance for a lot of the time. Yeah, Patriots did do a good job against Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham. Uh, they combined for a hundred and seventeen yards on ten catches. Odell Beckham had five catches for fifty-two yards. Neither one of those guys scored. Uh, tight end Demetrius Harris was the only one who did score. That was in coverage against. Or uh, Dante Hightower was in coverage. Didn't look great in coverage, but, I mean, Patriots really linebackers game, are playing yeah. so well right now that, you know, it, th- that's happened before to Dante Hightower. It's not a shock that he didn't look particularly great in coverage, but the Patriots have been using him to his strengths really uh, throughout the rest of the season. But, no, I mean, I I would say that this is probably the – I wasn't expecting – I wouldn't have said that I expected Nick Chubb to rush for 131 yards, but at the same time – I mean, I did a DraftKings lineup based solely on that game, and Nick Chubb was the only Browns player that I had in that game because I do think that, you know, if you're if you're looking at this from a fantasy perspective or, or purely from a numbers perspective, the opposing running back is going to do much better against the Patriots than the opposing quarterback. The Patriots are stronger against the pass. And then, like I mentioned earlier, and you made a good point, obviously Chubb had the 44-yard run early in the game, but teams, when they're down so so much early in the game Patriots just don't really care if you run the ball against them so so naturally running backs will have more rushing yards against them or or will be a little bit more productive on the ground uh, than they will be through the air yeah well I think we'll see a lot we'll, we'll get a lot better sense of the Patriots run defense this week um, yeah. I don't know if we want to get into Ravens now or if we want to get hit anything else before the no uh, I, I, I don't think there's that much more to hit on um on the game against the Browns than we already did. But, yeah, I mean, the, the game against the, the Ravens, is it's going to be tough. Uh, they've got, obviously, the, the fastest quarterback in the NFL, Lamar Jackson. Uh, and then Mark Ingram is certainly no slouch as a running back. He's having a really good season so far. So I asked Belichick about this this morning of how do you balance being big up front to basically stop Mark Ingram while also keeping enough speed on the field to contain Lamar Jackson because – you can't spy Lamar Jackson with Elan and Roberts. You can't spy Lamar Jackson with Kyle Van Noy or Dante Hightower or Jawan Bentley because he's much faster than those players. You almost have to spy. I mean, you can almost got to be Jamie Collins or a safety. I don't even know yeah. if it can be Jamie Collins, and I would even say that I don't know if you can spy him with Patrick Chung because he's so much faster. Uh, my initial thought was maybe they use Jonathan Jones in that role. The guy's been playing. He's played in the box as a safety before. He's played in the box as a slot cornerback before. Use him in that Patrick Chung pseudo safety role as some sort of spy against Lamar Jackson. Because he, he's also a pretty good tackler, a pretty good run defender. He's an undersized guy, but they have to use some sort of hybrid of a base defense and like a nickel or dime defense in this game because you, you probably have to have Adam Butler, Danny Shelton, and Lawrence Guy up front for a lot of snaps, but you also have to have fast defensive backs on the field as well. So I'm interested to see what happens this week, and this might not be a big game for Elena Roberts or Juwan Bentley or... I mean, some of those other kind of hybrid linebacker edge players. It'll be interesting to see what the snaps look like by the end of the game. Yeah, this is going to be a fascinating matchup. They really, as Bill Belichick's mentioned a couple times this week, 
no other team in the NFL really runs the type of offense that the the Ravens run with. It's so kind of extreme. It's basically running the ball and throwing the ball deep down the field. Those are the two yeah. things that Lamar Jackson does very well. He he does have a very good arm. He's very good on the deep ball. Um, but his his kind of bread and butter is is these runs and, and these kind of both designed runs and, and scrambles. And the most the most kind of fascinating and important stat that I found this week uh, was one from Sports Source Analytics is Lamar, the way that Lamar Jackson has played on third down has mm-hmm. really been kind of the key to the Ravens' offense mm-hmm. this season. On third down this season, Jackson has run the ball 21 times. He's averaging 9.0 yards per rush and has converted 62% of those third down attempts. He's gained 190 yards when running on third down. The next best in the league is Chris Carson with 83. So, That's crazy. And a lot of those are, I mean, you could say, well, yeah, sure, a lot of those are probably third and 14s, third and 15s. Right. But Jackson is doing that on those on those downs and still converting. He's converted yeah, a third and 14. Yeah. He's converted a third and 20. He's converted a couple third and 10. So that is going to be the biggest key in this game for me, for the Patriots, is making sure that Lamar Jackson doesn't kind of get out of their grasp on third down and extend these drives with kind of crazy scrambles that like he's he's been able to do against the Seahawks a couple weeks ago and against the Browns a couple weeks before that and yeah. he's really been doing it all season I think that's the teams haven't had much trouble kind of getting the Ravens into those kind of third and long situations right. but getting them off the field in those is hard much harder against them than it is against almost any other team yeah I mean you definitely have to to rush Mar Jackson quite a bit different Patriots have usually had a decent amount of success possibly surprisingly sacking mobile quarterbacks. I remember what, there was a game against the Bills where they had like nine sacks on Tyrod Taylor. Something they always like tended to play well against Tyrod Taylor. For yeah, some I, I don't remember. I mean, obviously he's a much different player. I don't remember how many sacks they had against Josh Allen earlier this mm-hmm. season. I think um, it, was, it was four or five, I believe. Yeah, and how many times has Jackson been sacked? He's been sacked 17 times already this season. Um, he was sacked 16 times last season in the same amount of games. So, I mean, he's a guy that you can bring down, but there's certainly a threat involved there because once he gets out, out of the pocket and once he finds any space, then he becomes much more dangerous. Um, if there's a way, I think that, you know, as good as the Patriots pass rush has been and as good as their linebackers have been, you probably do want to hang back against Lamar Jackson because he's obviously not as good of a passer as he is a runner. And the Ravens don't have the greatest passing weapons either. Their top receivers are are Willie Sneed, Seth Roberts, Marquise Brown, who's a rookie, Miles Boykin, who's a rookie. Uh, they've got good tight ends with, with Mark Andrews and, and Hayden Hurst and, and Nick Boyle, but it's not like you're going up against a Odell Beckham or a or a Jarvis Landry. Uh, Hollywood Brown has a ton of speed, but he's a rookie. I he, mean, he's, he's also you can only also, expect so much out of him. Yeah, he also missed the last two games with with an ankle injury. Right. Uh, and beyond like his he, first game when he he went off for however many touchdowns it was against the he, Dolphins, he really hasn't done that much uh, as a you know wide receiver either this season. Yeah, their their kind of assortment of weapons is definitely not as. If you stack it up between them and and the the group that they saw last week against the Cleveland Browns, the the Browns definitely have an advantage in that department, yeah. um, which is part of the reason why the Ravens use their tight ends so much because yeah. their receivers are they're fast and they've got some talent. Like Marquise Brown is crazy fast, and and uh, Miles Boykin might have been the most athletic mm-hmm. wide receiver in this entire uh, draft class, but they are young and they are a little bit raw. Uh, and one one more note on this offense too. Uh, Bill Belichick mentioned the fact that nobody else really runs this offense right now. That doesn't mean the Patriots haven't seen this offense before because Greg Roman, the uh, the Ravens offensive coordinator, he was the San Francisco 49ers offensive coordinator during the early days of the Colin Kaepernick yep. where Colin Kaepernick had a very productive game here against the Patriots mm-hmm. back in, what was that, 2012, 2013? Yeah. Uh, and then he was with the Bills with uh, when Tyrod Taylor was there, as we mentioned before. So yeah. this is a system, well, it, maybe it's not – exactly the same as it was back then it is the it's not completely new for the Patriots and this Patriots coaching staff for sure uh Ravens defense hasn't been you know probably the the same type of defense as, as the Patriots are used to seeing out of a Ravens defense their their pass rush has especially been a little bit underperforming this season they they certainly lost some pieces there with Terrell Suggs and uh and Zadarius Smith um and they didn't replace them with 
with many big names, really. I mean, they, their top pass rushers are, are Matthew Judon, who's been kind of kicking around the NFL for a while, Pernell McPhee. Um, they've still got those big bodies up front with Brandon Williams and everything. But it just it, – this is a good game – for the Patriots offense maybe to get back on track a little bit just because it shouldn't be quite as challenging, especially as, as last game for the Patriots offensive line. You're not going up against Miles Garrett and Olivier Vernon when the, the guy that you have to worry about is Matthew Judon. You're, you're in decent shape there. Yeah, this isn't a, uh, isn't kind of the Ravens front seven that we're used to seeing. No. Uh, there's no, there's no Haloti Nada or there's no Ray right. Lewis and there's no even the, the two Smiths that you just mentioned or the, the Smith that you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, they do have some talent in the secondary. They got Earl Thomas, um, yeah. who's been pretty productive this season. They just picked Jim up Smith is coming back. Yep, they just picked up Marcus Peters uh, last yeah. week. Um, I know neither of us have been super high on the way Marcus Peters has played over the last right. couple of years, but he did have a uh, an interception in that first game that he played against the Seahawks last week. So some talent on this defense, but this is definitely a group that on paper the Patriots should be able to move the ball pretty well against. Uh, I think the offensive line is going to be is going to continue to be. Uh, kind of a point of emphasis for the Patriots. We talked to Dante Scarnecchia this week, and it's pretty clear that he has not been happy with the way the offensive line has played this season, uh, especially in the running game, but also in in pass protection as well. Uh, Marshall Newhouse had a pretty rough game against Miles Garrett last week. Um, Marcus Cannon actually played pretty well against uh, Miles mm-hmm. Garrett, uh, as he kind of tends to do against right. against uh, top-level pass rushers. But that's that's going to continue to be a point of emphasis for the Patriots until um, until Isaiah Wynn can return, which could be in Week 12, could be a little bit later. He was back at practice this week, but they're they're going to need Marshall Newhouse to pull down the fort until then. Definitely, and yeah, we'll see if we'll see if Jack Mason can play. If not, it'll be James Fans probably again there at right guard. Um, but even as a run defense, I mentioned Brandon Williams is in there. He's obviously a very good nose tackle, but the the numbers the if you the surface numbers look good as far as the the Ravens run defense. They've only allowed 590 yards this season, uh, which is third best in the NFL. But a lot of that is opposing offenses trying to keep up with the Ravens' offense. Uh, they are 24th in touchdowns allowed. They've, they've allowed eight rushing touchdowns, and they're 18th in yards per carry with 4.3 yards per carry. So Patriots' r- rushing attack has been dismal this season. Very bad. Uh, Sonny Michelle is only averaging, I think, 3.3 yards per carry. The Patriots in general are only averaging 3.2 yards per carry. Uh, that's something we talked a lot to um, Dante Scardacchia, the Patriots offensive line coach, and running backs coach Ivan Fears on Monday when Patriots assistants talked. And, I mean, they they both sounded like things can improve, but it wasn't super optimistic. I, I thought one of the most interesting things that Fears said was that the Patriots, it, it's the problem is that it's not just one thing. It's, it's everything that's causing the Patriots rushing attack to struggle. So, a lot of things have to improve, and they, there are a lot of elements in play. I mean, James Devlin is on injured reserve. You just mentioned Isaiah Wynn has been out. Uh, Shaq Mason was out this last game. David Andrews is out for the season with a blood clot in his lungs. The Patriots' backup fullback, Jakob Johnson, is out. And then combine all of that with the fact that Rex Burkhead has been missing games, and Sony Michelle is a decent running back, but, I mean, there, there's nothing that he's done I don't know. I mean, he, he was much better last season, but obviously the, the offensive line was a lot better last year, and he had a fullback last year. He also this had season, Rob Gronkowski last year. Right, he had Rob Gronkowski and Dwayne Allen as well. Uh, there's been nothing this season that's that's shown us that Sonny Michel is an above-average running back. And I think that that's the biggest thing that he has to start to prove is that he can start doing something more on his own. Another point that Ogden has made was that Patriots have to start avoiding negative plays. Sonny Michel already has 16 carries that have gone for negative yards this season. He only had 12 last season, and he had significantly more carries last season too. So he has to stop going backwards. And as, as Ivan Fear said, sometimes you just have to truck a guy over. And Sonny Michel has shown a hesitance to do that because he has been hesitant at the line of scrimmage, waiting for holes to open up. Yeah, that's what I was just going to bring up. That was the most kind of telling thing that, that I heard from Fears yesterday, the fact that Sony Michelle is obviously at his best when his blockers are there, but when you're a number one running back in the NFL, you need to kind of bury your way through, yeah. some, through some plays at times, and at the very least, make sure you're getting back to the line of scrimmage or, or getting something out of this run. You're, you're not getting dropped a, a yard or two in the backfield, which is happening far too much with Sony Michelle. Uh, it's also uh, we also heard a little bit about uh, Damian Harris uh, yesterday, who we still have not 
seen much at all. It doesn't sound like we will see much of this season. It mm-hmm. sounds like he is firmly on the uh, the James White, Shane Vereen yeah. uh, rookie track where basically, what was it, um, Ivan Fierce said, we believe he'll he'll – We'll, we believe we'll see good things from him when he has to play, and they said when he has to play. <laughs> they they have no uh, stress to that. Yeah, yeah, I mean even even with the struggles that the Patriots have had so far, uh, I know some people have been kind of pushing for Damian Harris to get his chance. Doesn't sound like that's going to happen unless multiple Patriots running backs get hurt over these next couple of weeks. For sure, I think that will do it. Uh, let's finish off by playing America's favorite game, where we guess where guys that we've never heard of went to school. Guard Patrick McCarry. Patrick McCarry. He went to Wisconsin. I'm going to go with... Um, I'm going to go with Notre Dame. Mm. Let's see. What is it? Cal. Oof, Cal. Patrick West Coast McKay guy. went to Cal. All right. Um, you got I'll, one I'll take one here. Where did... Do you know where Gus Edwards went to school? He went to Rutgers, right? Is he a Rutgers guy? Did he go to Rutgers? Rutgers! Oh, he did. There you go. Nailed it. I did not know that. Well, in in the Dynasty League that you were in last year, <laughs> and then your your team was terrible, so you gave that up. <laughs> My team is Callahan. now half decent. Your team is now half decent, yes. Well, um, you and you and uh, Andrew really pulled things together over that offseason. Still, still the minority owner. When, when you were fired and he was <laughs> brought aboard. Um, but... There was a, a trade that myself and former Patriots beat reporter Kevin Duffy made at the NFL Scouting Combine where I believe I gave up a 2020 third-round pick for Gus Edwards. Oh, Listen, it, it, it has not paid off much yet at this point, but if Mark Ingram goes down at any point, Gus Edwards could wind up being a second half star for my team. Hey, when you guys, when you when you hear about wheeling and dealing at the scouting combine, that's exactly this what we're, is what we're talking, about. talking about. It's all fantasy football trades. Yep, it was at a uh, prime prime steakhouse. <laughs> I think it was at like three in the morning, um, and we fired off that email to the rest of the league that that Gus Edwards was on the move from uh, whatever Kevin's team's name is to my team. So yeah, that will do it for this week's Ness and Patriots podcast. Uh, Join us next week when we will be recapping the Ravens game and and previewing a bye week, I guess. Uh, Beyond that... We'll do some mid-season reviews, superlatives, second half preview, all that good stuff. Ooh, all-name all-star Fish Fish Smithson is on the Ravens injured reserve list, so that's that's fun. Um, But keep it on Nesson.com for all of your Patriots coverage. Follow Zach on Twitter at ZachCoxNesson. Follow me on Twitter at Doug Kide. And keep your dial tuned to Nesson at night because I'm on there a decent night with Matt Chatham. And tune in Sunday early evening um, during those 4 o'clock games because we'll be doing our pregame chat live from Baltimore. And then uh, Matt Chatham and someone will be in studio for that pregame chat that will be on Facebook.com slash Nesson. Enough of the plugs. I'll see you later. Thank you.